If you have your Bibles, Matthew chapter 18 this morning is where we're going to turn. Um, And I'm letting you sit down because it's a little bit of a long one. So starting with verse 15 of Matthew 18, please hear these words. At the end of it, when we do, this is the word of the Lord, help me, so I don't have to do what we did last week and make us repeat it, okay? So Matthew 18, starting with verse 15. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and his children and all that he had in payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii, and seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me, and I will pay you. He refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So also my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. This is the word of the Lord. Excellent. Well done. This is a fun parable, isn't it? Okay. All right. Yeah. Yes. Happy, happy parable. Um, if it's okay with you, some of you guys probably thought, if you, if you got my email, you know this. Um, the plan was today to go into a new series. And it was a series the elders and I had discussed and prayed about, and we just, we couldn't get comfortable completely with it. And last week when we got done with the parable of the prodigal son, I'm like, I don't want to stop. I want to keep going um, with these parables. So if it's okay, and even if it's not okay with you, at least today I got to keep going. Um, we're going to continue with the parables for a couple more weeks, because there's some, I've never... I feel like Mr. Rogers. Let's talk. <laughs> Sorry. It's very Robin Williams distracted right there. Um, I, I just can't shake these parables, and there's some more that, that I want to unpack with you. Now, here's what happened. Last week, we covered Luke chapter 15 and this trilogy of lost things, lost sheep, lost coin, lost son. And we focused in on the third part, the climactic moment of this trilogy, which was the parable of the prodigal son. Now, that's in Luke chapter 15. It's interesting because all the way back in Matthew 18, Matthew also records a whole bunch of parables. He also does one of the three lost stories. He doesn't do the lost coin, and he doesn't do the prodigal son. Instead, he does the lost sheep, and he does that in, um, in Matthew chapter 18. It's fascinating to me, because in that story, it's a story about being forgiven. So it's a story about God's grace and how kind and compassionate our Heavenly Father is when he goes and finds that lost sheep. And then immediately out of that, immediately out of that, comes this section that we just read about us forgiving others. So first parable is about him forgiving us. And then the second parable that tags in Matthew is a parable about us forgiving others others. And in this, there's an interesting correlation where he understands, and we're going to see this at the end of the message today, that throughout scripture, Jesus constantly is not just emphasizing, hey, if you want to be forgiven by the Father, you must forgive, but he's commanding it over and over again. If you want to find grace and compassion from your heavenly Father, you must extend grace and compassion to those who have sinned against you. Now, in the parables, just so you're aware, and I, I want to make this, reiterate, this microphone is jammed. Oh, I can't do the handheld. I can't. It's kryptonite. It's terrible. <laughs> Can you handle the popping? Will you guys be okay? Because you're going you're gonna to lose me if I have to do that microphone. Um, in, in this, one, one thing I want to make sure you guys are aware of with the parables, remember, 
It's, it's a compound word. The word parable is a compound word, even in the Greek. It's parabole, para, para, this front end meaning to cast along or to come beside, and bole is to cast along. So to cast along beside something. A parable is a story cast alongside a truth. So Jesus isn't just this master storyteller that's like a really cool grandpa that's going out telling great stories and everybody wants to listen to his stories and his, and his fairy tales. Instead, Jesus is telling these stories to go alongside of a spiritual truth that he's emphasizing. And those that capture these truths are those that have ears to hear and eyes to see. Those that don't are the Pharisees who are blinded from all of this. So this is what's going on in these parables. And so we see in Matthew chapter 18, this shift from being forgiven to now forgiving. And it's interesting, we're not going to talk about this first part very much. The, the Matthew 18, this section is divided into three sections. First is what to do when somebody sins against you. Then a question. Secondly, is a question that Peter asked. And thirdly, it's Jesus' response to that question in the form of a parable. So it starts with kind of what we would look to if we were doing any sort of church discipline. And I don't want to go dive, dive deeply into this. Roger did a great job on this. In, uh, it was on St. Patrick's Day in March. And Roger covered this in March, this understanding of these three ways that we handle when somebody sins against you. First of all, go privately to them. If they don't respond, then bring a witness, okay? So this is even seen in Revelation. We see this in Revelation, this idea of a witness or two or more, and we'll talk about this in a minute. And then thirdly, if they don't respond to that, bring them before the church. In our context, the way that we're governed as a church, this doesn't mean we bring that person before the entire congregation. We would bring them before the elders who you have elected, and this is the way it works in our church. So these are action steps for when somebody sins against you. Now, I wanted to point out two verses real quickly before we go on to Peter's question, which is an awesome question, by the way. In Matthew chapter 18, verse 18 there's a common verse. There's a verse that a lot of us are very familiar with, but we got to remember, we need to remember, context matters. Listen to verse 18. Jesus says, truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now, growing up, I've heard this verse over and over again, and uh, growing up in a charismatic story, and I'm not saying this is necessarily wrong, but we need to understand context. Um, we can see this being used as binding demons or loosing, loosening demons. That's not what this is talking about here. In context, this is church discipline issues. When a brother has sinned to the point where there's absolutely no repentance, at the end of it, he's saying, whatever you loose, whatever you as a church loose, will be stamp of approval given from heaven. This goes all the way back to when Jesus talks to Peter and says, upon this rock, I will build my church, and the keys of the kingdom are given to him. In other words, given to the church. We're in these disciplinary actions, in these roles. The church has the authority to do this, and Christ gives his stamp of approval, as long as the church is acting biblically. And then he comes along in verse 19 and 20, and he kind of confirms that. He says, again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. So it's easy for us to look at that verse and say, if two or three of us gather together and we can pray for miracles and we can pray for the sick, and it has to happen. Again, there, there is some biblical precedence to this, but in this context, what it's talking about is agreement on church discipline issues when somebody has sinned and they are unrepentant. Okay, so that's what's going on here. Out of this, out of, again, if you're new here, just understand this, that Simon Peter is my hero. Like, Every time Simon Peter opens his mouth in scripture, I want to hear what's going on. I, I love the things he thinks. I love the things he says. I like how competitive he is with the other disciples. I love the questions that he asks because most of the time he asks the questions that everybody else in the discipleship posse is afraid to ask. They're all thinking it. And, G, and Peter's always the one that will step forward and ask it. And we get it again here. Jesus is explaining, hey, here's the three steps of forgiving a brother or bringing a brother to repentance, and it's all in redemption. The purpose of this is to bring them to, to some kind of restoration inside the body. And out of that, Peter steps up, and he asks this question. So, Jesus, how many times am I obligated to forgive somebody who has sinned personally against me? That's a legitimate question. That, that's a question that I think all of us, at some point in our life, when somebody has sinned against us, have thought, how, how, how many times do I have to forgive them? And now, one thing I want you to note before we go forward, in all of this forgiveness talk that we're going to talk about in the scriptures today, this, and Jesus telling us to forgive a whole bunch, 
The idea isn't you stay in any kind of abusive situation. This doesn't mean you stay in the condition. We're talking about emotionally you let go of this. You release this emotion. You release this harboring of bitterness in your heart. You let it go. You forgive them. It doesn't mean, so if you're in an abusive relationship, this does not mean you stay. I need you to hear that. That's not what's going on. So Peter's like, how many times? Somebody, somebody sins against me. How many times do I forgive them? And then Peter does something absolutely genius. He pats himself on the back a little bit. He gives, a, you know when you ask a question, but in that question you're actually kind of showing off a little bit. Peter's like, how many times should I forgive my brother? Seven times? He throws out a big number, right? It's a big number. And here's why it's a big number. Now, if, if you're eating a bag of M&Ms or a bag of potato chips, seven is not a very big number, right? You, you need more than seven. Like, you cannot just eat seven. But when it comes to somebody who has repeatedly and habitually sinned against you, forgiving them seven times is an astronomical number. I would dare say one is a pretty big number when it comes to that. But here's the thing. The rabbis of the day had a code, and their code was we will forgive anybody that personally harms us. They're unrepentant, or they, they pretend to be repentant. They keep coming back over and over again. We will forgive them three times. But on the fourth time, no more. I, I, after that, unforgiveness. I'm allowed to unforgive. So think about what Peter's doing. Peter's coming to Jesus, and he's given a little bit of a sick brag. He's like, okay, so the rabbis, these super spiritual rabbis, are thinking that we should forgive people three times. Jesus, what say you? Seven? Like, I've doubled the rabbi's number and added one. So what do you think? Seven. Should we forgive people seven times? And do you remember what Jesus said? And Jesus responds to Peter in Matthew 18, and this should be our life verse. Jesus said to him, to Peter, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times. Now, ladies and gentlemen, three seems like a big number when one seems hard to me when it comes to forgiving people. Three seems like a really big number. Seven is an astronomical number. 77, can you imagine forgiving the same person of the same sin committed against you 77 different times. And here's where it really gets interesting to me. Now, this really goes back to how Jesus was quoting. Jesus is quoting Genesis chapter 4 here when he says, forgive up to 77 times. Now, we know the New Testament, whenever the New Testament, and this is tricky, so keep up with me. When the New Testament quotes the Old Testament, it's often quoting what is known as the Septuagint. The Septuagint is the Greek translation of the original Hebrew scriptures. So there's a little bit of difference. So sometimes when the authors are quoting the Old Testament, sometimes, rarely, they will quote the original Hebrew. Other times they will quote the Septuagint, which is the Greek version of the Old Testament scriptures. If Jesus, and this is where interpreters really struggle and wrestle about what number Jesus is quoting. If Jesus is quoting directly from Genesis chapter 4 in the Hebrew scriptures, that he's saying, forgive 77 times. But if he's quoting like everybody else did, if he's quoting the Septuagint translation, the Septuagint doesn't say 77 times. It says 70 times 7. There's going to be a lot of math today, but this is one of the easiest ones. 70 times 7. Dr. Duran, you got it for me? Putting you, do you, okay, how much? Your answer is, huh? 490. Very good. All right. He earned his diploma. So it's 400. 400. Okay. So three is a big number. Forgive somebody three times for the same action over and over again. My lid's blowing off. I'm going, okay, okay. Seven times, Peter. That's astronomical. Jesus, 77 times is a lot. 490 times? That's absolutely absurd. Here's what we're supposed to catch and just let it out of the bag right now. When it comes to forgiveness, Jesus is demanding that we forgive others who have harmed us. Not stay in the situation, but we forgive them. We release them. We release the bitterness. We release the anger. We release all, the, all of it. Doesn't mean it's not going to hurt. Doesn't mean it's not going to leave a mark. It's not going to mean that there's no residual um, calamity around you. All of that's going to happen, but release it unlimited amount of times. A big number, as we looked at in the book of Revelation. This is a big number. Big number. And it, it, it reminded me when Peter's like, hey, should, you know, the rabbis say three times. I say seven times. What say you, Jesus? Jesus is just like, he's playing. You remember when you were kids and you played the higher, lower game? You're like, until you figured out the number. Like, hey, I've got a number and I'm back in my head and I'm trying, to, I, I want you to guess. And you're like, four. You're like, no, higher. Four million, lower. 
and you just keep recalibrating till you get to this, Jesus is just like, one time should I forgive him? Higher. Three times? Higher. Seven times? Higher. Wasn't there in one of the, the legal cases lately, somebody just kept saying, more, more? That, that's what's going on here. Jesus is like, more, more, until we finally get to this number of either 77 or 490. Now, within these two passages lies the difference between discipline and and forgiveness. Because we've got, hey, if somebody sins against you, here are the three steps. Here are the disciplinary actions to lead them to redemption. Discipline does not equal unforgiveness. Just because you discipline somebody doesn't mean you don't forgive them. You still are required to forgive, and you are required to discipline so that they can grow. Discipline is a tool to get people to behave properly within an established set of rules. Forgiveness is the act of excusing an offense or a mistake or a sin. It's the emotional release of the judgment harbored towards someone who has hurt you, but forgiveness and discipline can and do work together and must never be thought of as contrary to one another. So Peter asks, how many times should I forgive somebody? And Jesus responds, unlimited, Peter, unlimited. Now, let's step out of the text for a minute. Just a quick second. Is that easy? Let's be real with the text for a minute. Because everybody's listening to this, and I would imagine their minds are blown. If somebody has personally sinned against you, hurt you, hurt you, and Jesus demands that you forgive them, you're like, okay, just this one time. He's like, no, 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 no. Every time. Every time. How do we do that? And from that, Jesus now bounces into a parable, and it's one of the coolest parables in the entire scripture, this parable of the unforgiving servant. So if you didn't capture it when I read it, here's what's going on. There's two characters, two main characters in this story. We're going to give them names, okay? So servant number one, we're going to call him Chad, okay? I don't think we have any Chads. I pick names that I'm like, I don't think there's a Chad in here. If your name is Chad or your middle name is Chad, forgive me, okay? Just servant number one is Chad. Servant number two, we're going to call him Smitty, okay? So we got Chad and we got Smitty. Servant number one, servant number two. And here's how the story goes. Once upon a time, servant number one, Chad, was indebted to his master, to his king, and he owed 10,000 talents. We'll get to how much that is in just a moment. He owed a significant amount of money to this king. And so the king, in order to get this guy to pay off his debt because he wasn't paying off his debt, said, I'm going to sell you into slavery, but I'm also going to sell your wife and your kids, and you're all going to be sold into slavery. And so at which point Chad is like, oh, shoot, that can't happen. That's really bad news. So Chad pleads with his king, pleads with his master, please don't send them away. Please don't sell us. Please have mercy on us. And how does the king respond? Okay, cool. Debt wiped wiped clean, totally clean. This 10,000 talents that you owe me, because you pleaded, because you asked for mercy, I am going to wipe it clean. No IOUs, no payment plans, no interest, no works, nothing. The debt is wiped clean. And in a minute, you'll see how big that debt was. And I promise you, it's a really big deal what Chad just got forgiven of. And so Chad, after he's been forgiven, he, he walks out, and he's just doing his business, walking along the street, and he runs into Smitty, servant number two. And it just so happens that this fellow servant, Smitty, owes Chad some money, and he owes him the grand total of 100 denarii. So Chad owed the king 10,000 talents, but Smitty owes Chad, this is one long story problem for math class, okay? And it's a fun one, okay? We're not going to ask where the two trains meet or anything like that. Just (laughs) stick with me. So Smitty owes Chad 100 denarii, and Chad loses his mind. Chad loses his mind. He goes off on Smitty, says he starts choking him. Smitty is begging and pleading, hey, I will pay you back. Have mercy on me. Have compassion on me. And and Chad's like, no, I'm going to choke you out, man. And he calls the jailers, and the jailers arrest Smitty and put him in jail. How how is Smitty supposed to pay his debt if he's in jail? We talked about this before service. You only make, what, two bucks an hour making license plates. So how, how, how are you going to pay this debt in all? That was them. That was not me. That was those guys that said that. So Smitty owes Chad a certain amount of money. Chad refuses to relieve him of this debt when Chad has just been relieved of a debt of his 
own, at which point Jesus pulls it all together. Shall we talk about numbers? All of you guys that like numbers, Matt Heise, you are going crazy. Matt and Jessa are loving this. Steve is going to check everything I have right now to make sure my numbers are right. And so we're going to throw out some numbers right now. Everybody that hated story problems in school, I'll do the work for you, okay? And I promise if you stick with me, it is so worth it. So here's what we want to do. We want to figure out how big was Chad's debt to the king, how much was he forgiven, and how much was Smitty's debt to Chad that went unforgiven, and what's the correlation between the two? We're going to work backwards because it it lands a bigger punch if we do it backwards. We're going to talk about Smitty's debt to Chad, okay? So servant number two owes Chad some money. Chad goes nuts and chokes this dude out. Okay, so how much money did Smitty owe Chad? How much money did servant number two owe servant number one? The number we're given was 100 denarii. So let's break it down. One denarii at that point of time was equivalent to one day's wage. So it was worth one day's wage. Okay, so this is really important that we understand this. How much you make in one day is one denarii. Now, this is where I had to do some research outside of my commentaries. So I pulled up an article, a 2023 article, the most recent one I could find, by the USA Today. Um, I I know they're probably not the greatest source, but they're color-coded and easy to read for somebody like me. So we're going to go with these numbers. The point is, even if they're not exact, they are pretty stinking close. In 2023, I needed to find out what what is one-day wage for the average American. Let's put it in 2024 terms or 2023 terms for the average American. What, What does that look like? Well, the average annual income, and this blew my mind, The band, this did not blow their mind. They didn't think this was high. I thought this was a high number, okay? So our band is apparently loaded. One of them is our youth pastor. So um, in this, what what does the average American make per year? And this is taking away, like, kids straight out of college and flipping burgers. And it also takes out high-end CEOs, okay? So it's what does the average American make annually in terms of income? And that number is, drum roll, $59,000 a year. I'm like, that's a pretty stinking high number. I I thought it would be lower than that. I I really did. So the average American makes $59,000 a year. Just a couple quick things from the USA Today. The highest income earners, the the median age for your peak is 44 years old. That ship has sailed for me. So that was fun. Um, The average income by state, Mississippi is the lowest earning state with an average income of 48,000. Massachusetts is the highest earning state of 86. I can't, I didn't look up what Florida is. Um, And then if you take out these different types of occupation, the average salary by occupation, the highest earner in the U.S. in 2022 were cardiologists. They made $421,000 a year and they, they earn it. Like, they, they, they definitely earn it. And the lowest earners, you're never, I would give you 100 guesses, and you would never guess. The lowest earner makes $27,870 a year, and that's a hair shampooer, somebody whose profession is to wash hair. That, that has nothing to do with our sermon. I just thought that that was really interesting. So, back to Smitty. Smitty owes Chad. Smitty owes Chad 100 denarii. One denarii is worth one day's wage. How do we figure out one day's wage? We take $59,000, the annual income, and we divide it by the number of days one would work in a year. So we're assuming we don't work 365 days in a year. If you do, your boss is rough, okay? And there's probably a parable about him somewhere in there or her. So instead, let's take the weekends out and let's say that you work 260 days in a year. So we'll divide $59,000 by 260 days in a year, which means the average American makes per day $227. Got it? With me so far? If you're not, just shake your head and pretend just like you did in math class. Yeah, I got it, just so we can keep going. Okay, so $227 a day is one denarii. But Smitty owed Chad how many denarii? 100. So we take $227 times 100, and now we get the number that Smitty owes Chad, which is $22,700. A lot of money, right? If you don't think that's a lot of money, please come talk to me. And you can write me a check for not a lot of money right after service, and I will gladly take that not a lot of money off your hands and invest it in myself, okay? So please... (laughs) Please give me that. So we're we're supposed to feel this. This is the price of a brand new Kia. 
right? And 22,000 bucks. So the, I can see why Chad is mad. You owe me $22,700. So we're not supposed to brush this off. Um, we're supposed to feel this. But, but the point of the parable isn't what Smitty owes Chad. It goes back to what Chad owes the king. So we know what Smitty owes Chad. Now let's talk about what Chad owed the king, okay? So Smitty, Smitty owed 100 denarii. Denarii was one day's wage. Chad owes the king 10,000 talents. Now talents is a denomination. It's a denomination, not a currency as in, like we don't have a dollar bill. We don't have an actual physical currency bill for the million dollars. I don't think. If we do, show it to me. Let me hold it, please. Again, I'll see what I can do with that. But, but that's what's going on with the talent. So one denarii with Smitty equaled one day's wage. One talent, one talent equaled, not one day's wage, 17 years of wages. Ladies and gentlemen, don't, I'll, I'll give you the numbers. Don't even try to figure it out. Put your calculators down for a minute. This church is 17 years old. That's me giving up every sal- every paycheck I've had for 17 years for one talent, for one talent. One talent equals 17 years of wages. The average American annual salary is $59,000. So how do we figure out what one talent equals? Easy math, right? 17 years times $59,000 is the equivalent of one talent. One talent then is 59,000 times 17 years is $1,003,000. That's some serious cash. Ladies and gentlemen, how many talents was that? One. How many talents did Chad owe the king? 10,000 talents. So what's our next step in this word problem? Let's now multiply $1,003,000 times 10,000. And our number is a big number. Here's what the number is. The number is now $10 billion, $30 million. How do I know that's a big number? I know that's a big number because when we round it to the nearest billion, we're going to lop off $30 million as though it's not a big deal. That's a lot of money, right? $30 million bucks. Eh, we don't need that. We've got $10 billion going on. This is what Chad owed the king, 10 billion, 30 million dollars. In other words, 10.03, not 10.3, 10.03 billion dollars. Let me put that in perspective for you. Assuming you do make $59,000 a year and you applied $59,000 a year to that debt at 0% interest because the king is really generous and he gives you a 0% loan and you have to pay back $10 billion, $30 million, giving 100% of your paycheck. You're not paying the utilities. Well, I guess they didn't have electricity and running water back then. But you, no clothes, no food. $59,000 went to this debt. How many years would it take to pay off a debt of $10 billion, $30 million, making $59,000 a year? The answer, ladies and gentlemen, is 100 in 70,000 years, 17 times 10,000, 170,000 years. Now, unless you're Captain America or Wolverine, you aren't going to live that long. <laughs> so you're probably not going to pay off that debt. Now, should the king want some interest to his loan, if it's a loan that you're indebted to, and he gives you a very generous interest rate in today's market, and he says, hey, the interest rate on this $10 billion, $30 million loan is going to be 5%. Do you know what your annual payment would be on interest alone? Let me give it to you. dollars annually, but it's cool because you make $59,000 a year. So it's cool. That breaks down to monthly, 40, approximately $41,700,000 monthly, or daily, daily, $1.3 million daily at 5% interest just to pay the interest. Are, are you getting it? I, I want you to feel this. This is what Jesus wants us to feel. How in the world did this slave, this servant, Chad, First of all, incur a debt 
to this king of $10 billion. We don't find out. That's not part of the story. But the interesting thing is no amount of work, nothing he could do, even if he did it for the rest of eternity, could he ever catch up with and pay off this debt. This debt was so insurmountable that there was nothing he could do. There's no work he could do. He couldn't make enough license plates, or even if he was a cardiologist, he couldn't pay off this debt in his lifetime. There was nothing he could do about it. What Jesus was showing by this $10 billion in American currency in 2024, what he is showing us is that this number is a hyperbole. This is a number that just shows you can't pay it back. It's impossible. It's such an insurmountable number that no matter what you do, no matter what kind of work you do, you cannot pay this money back. It's absolutely impossible. It's impossible. How would you feel if someone relieved you of that debt? If you pleaded for mercy because you owe something that you cannot pay back, and the punishment for it is you are going to be sold to tormentors, and this is, what's going to be ha- this is what's going to happen to you. How would you feel if you pled to this king and this, the response of this king was, okay, since you asked, sure, I'll wipe it off. I'm not going to come up with a payment plan, no IOUs, nothing like that. I wipe it clean. $10 billion, $30 million, I wipe it clean. Feel pretty good, right? Do you remember the first time you paid off any kind of debt? If you've ever had, I'm I'm sure everybody in here is Dave Dave Ramsey. You've never had debt. But if you have, you remember paying off that very first debt? For me, it was a car that I bought when I was like 18, 19 years old. I I got a a used, barely used car. It was a, what do you call it? A demo car at the Ford dealership. It was a Ford probe, a 92 Ford probe. And I, I paid it off. As a matter of fact, it was one of the very first things Gary asked me when I was trying to, get his blessing to Mary Melanie. He's like, how'd you pay for your car, bro? I'm like, well, I worked. I, got, I had a job, and, and I paid it. And I remember the day I paid that off. And it was only, I think it was only 9,000 bucks. This is 1992, and I paid it off. And the day I paid it off, man, I felt so rich. I'm like, I have got an extra $82.67 per month that I can now blow on whatever I want. Faded jeans, whatever, three T-shirts all at once. I can wear, I can wear it all. Because I am now rich because I paid off my debt. Can you imagine? I'm serious. Can you imagine somebody wiping off a $10 billion debt that you owed? This is what we're supposed to feel. This is what we're supposed to experience. If you were just paying interest alone, it'd be $501 million a year. What a good king, right? What an incredible master that would say, you know what? I'll bear the brunt of that debt. Chad walks away, and as he's walking away, he runs into Smitty, a fellow servant, somebody in his own group, and Smitty owes him some money. And just a minute ago, we all agreed the amount of money that Smitty owes Chad, $22,700, the price of a new Kia, that's a lot of money. But is $22,700 a lot of money relative to $10 billion, $30 million? That's what we're supposed to catch here. Remember in the story of the parable or the prodigal son, the parable of the prodigal son, the prodigal son in his self-righteousness was playing the relativity game. He saw his righteousness because his brother was unrighteous. He's like, compared to him, I'm righteous, right? And we play that game. I'm good compared to Hitler. I'm maybe, I don't know, Mother Teresa, I don't know. But when we play that relativity game, we're not supposed to compare our, our goodness or our sin to other people. We're supposed to compare our goodness or our sin compared to almighty, holy, perfect God, at which point we always fall short. So we compare and we look, hey, Smitty owes Chad $22,700, a lot of money, but nothing compared to what Chad owed the king. And we're supposed to catch this. And out of this, Chad loses his mind over $22,000 arrest him, choke him out, put him in prison where he can't pay me back. This worthless scum. And all of a sudden, everything pulls back in this parable. The other servants see what's going on, and they report Smitty, or they report Chad to the king who had originally forgiven Chad because of all this debt. And the king is like, no, no, he didn't. And the king goes back at Chad, and he imposes on him the guilt that he deserves for the debt that he once incurred because he wouldn't forgive Smitty that same or that lower debt. So compared to ten billion dollars, twenty-two thousand seven hundred is very, very minuscule. 
and again, it's a game of relativity. 22,007 is a lot of money relative to what one makes yearly, right? That's what, one third of 59,000? But 22,007 is nothing compared to what Chad had been forgiven. Now, here's the point Jesus is making regarding how often and even to what extent we're willing to extend to someone who has hurt us. Whatever somebody has done, and I, I know this hurts on the service because we're like, that person owes me $22,700 in back pay. This is how much they've hurt me. So Jesus is showing whatever they have done pales in comparison to what we have done to our king and what we have been forgiven of. So if we have been forgiven of much, then we must extend a hand of grace for those that have hurt us relatively in a low amount. The question is, how did we ever accumulate this debt? Because this parable is pointing to us, guys. You and I, we're not smitty in this story. Some people believe we're smitty, where I can pay for my sins. I can pay it back. Just give me enough time. I'll do enough works. I'll contribute to the church. I'll give to the poor, to the needy, and give me enough time. But the problem is we're not smitty in this story. We're Chad. We, we owe our Heavenly Father this debt that we cannot pay back. Our debt that we have incurred is larger than we could ever pay back with any kind of work, with any kind of attitude adjustment, even with everything we have. If we gave everything we have, in our lifetime, we could never pay off this debt. And we accumulated such debt or such a debt because of our sin. Every time we sin, that account is built. One sin, and all of a sudden, here we are. But our king looks at us as we repent and as we ask for grace and mercy. And our king wipes that slate clean because that's who he is. It's a testament to him, not to us. All we did was incur a debt and beg for mercy. And our king said, I will wipe it clean. I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. As, as I read scriptures, there is nothing more challenging in all of scripture than the command, not the ask, not the request, that we extend mercy to those that have hurt us, those that have sinned against us. And in case we're, wor- you good, bro? You good? Okay. In case we're worried that this is just a one-time thing and maybe Jesus didn't really mean it, remember, this is the end of the parable. He says, so also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. So what, what the king does to Chad by throwing him into eternal prison, Jesus is saying this is your destiny should you not forgive those who have sinned against you. And in case we think it's just a one-time thing, in the Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6, this is how the Lord's Prayer goes in case you've forgotten. Pray land like this, Jesus says, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Verse 14 and 15, for if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your father forgive your trespasses. Then in Matthew 5, earlier in Matthew 5, when he's doing the the Sermon on the Mount and we're in the Beatitudes, one of the most beautiful Beatitudes is, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Again, Jesus' words, not mine. Then finally in Luke 6, this is what Jesus says. I say to you, I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. To the one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from the one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who begs from you. And from the one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. And as you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. If you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do, that, do the same. And if you lend to those, who, those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? For even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. But love your enemies, do good, and lend, expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High. For he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. And in case you're wondering, we are the ungrateful and the evil that he is kind to. And finally, he ends it with this, be merciful even as your father is merciful. All week long, as I've been preparing for this, I've been praying for you and praying for my heart because I know this isn't easy to do. The, the ask Jesus is giving us is a big deal where he has forgiven us a lot. 
And it's so easy for us to keep our eyes on the $22,000 that's owed us. He's like, but I want you to remember your debt and then compare what somebody else owes you in relativity or relativity to relative to what you owed the king. Every time we talk about grace, I bring this up. You cannot fully understand grace unless you first understand the depravity of our heart. Grace and mercy makes no sense unless you understand what you've been forgiven. So the moral of this story of this, of this parable is to look at what you've been forgiven. You've been forgiven a debt in Christ Jesus that you could never repay. No work, no, no amount of Hail Marys, no, nothing you could do could ever wipe away that debt. The mercy of the king and the king alone is what wiped your debt clean through the blood of his son, Jesus, on the cross. And then the command that comes from that, that stems from that, is now turn around and do the same to those who have harmed you. And that's not easy. And I would imagine as you're sitting in your chair right now, there are people that you've harbored bitterness against. There's people that have a grip on you. They don't even know they have a grip on you. But because of the unforgiveness in your heart, you can't release it. You haven't. You chose to embrace it and hold on to it because you love that sting. You love that bitterness. You love the resentment and the anger. And Jesus is saying, you got to let it go. You have to let it go. You don't need to remain in the situation. But the command of Scripture, you've been forgiven much, now forgive others. And that's the word Christ has for us this morning. Let me pray for you. Jesus, in all honesty, this is, a vi- not only is this difficult, but it's also humbling. Because I think for, sometimes we forget that we are the first servant in this story. And we forget how much we've been forgiven by you, that we don't deserve the mercy that you've extended. We don't ex- deserve the grace that you've extended. We deserve all your wrath. But in your kindness, in your goodness, you poured out all that wrath on your son so that those that believe in Christ and what he has done for us in all sufficiency will have our debt wiped clean. That you won't hold that against us, that you will remove our sin as far as the east is from the west. Our filthy rags have become white as snow. And so we pause right now to thank you for what you've done, the debt that you have pardoned for us through your son that we stand as children of God today because of what you've done not because of what we've done and we're so grateful for that but God now on the flip side would you help us in those areas where we've been hurt and we, we really have been hurt that's not pretending these these things are real and they sting and they cut and it's easy for us to harbor that and hold on to that God, as a matter of fact, it could give us excuses during our life, but God, your command, your order here, your, 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 your blessing on us today is that if we forgive others, you will forgive us. So God, I pray that any area of unforgiveness in our heart, that today you would begin working on us in those areas, that you would give us the strength we need to be able to release those things to you, the strength we need when people do hurt us to allow grace and compassion to flow from us because we've been forgiven much as children of God. So God, I bless my brothers and sisters today. I pray that this week when we start putting this into practice, that you would be present with them. That you would give them courage. That you would give them just a holy tenacity to obey your commandments, trusting that God, you will reward those who are merciful. That you are faithful to those who are merciful. So God, we trust you today, Jesus. We thank you not only for the example you set, but the price you paid to forgive us all our sins. We confess our sin to you and pray, Jesus, just for your will to be accomplished in our life. It's in Jesus' name we pray.